I remember the last time we met, you were talking about the akama in the year. I asked you if that set up a lifelong uh, process of ibadah, a lifelong way of worship. Is there a way that we can start teaching our kids a lifelong pattern of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know what you just said is really absolutely true, that the first words the child would hear is the adhan and the akama and so on. It's like, you know, you're sitting up your child from the very beginning. You know, and this is a privilege for uh, uh, Muslims who receive their children uh, in a Muslim society where they get to hear the adhan five times a day versus Muslims who live in a non-Muslim society where they barely or sometimes they don't even hear the adhan period for years. And that's why we recommend at least you have one of those devices which call adhan whenever it's a prayer time. It's, it's a beautiful thing to hear the call of adhan. Mm. It's a reminder that uh, ibadah is the you and so on. And... Uh, in addition to the reminder, uh, it carries a great meaning. So you get uh, to see the opportunity to explain to your children the meaning of every uh, verse of the Adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Then uh, the word of the oneness of Allah and the word that is testifies that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. And that come to prayer where there is success in the prayer and so on. It's just a beautiful thing. Similarly with the Iqama. Uh, you know, uh, I have noticed that, uh, this is a very interesting fact, that I have noticed that the children will be able to copy the parents in the acts of the prayer as early as the age of a year and a half to two years. And you know what is the most beautiful scene ever in home? Is when you're praying and without any previous introduction, all of a sudden you see you're a child who's year and a half starting copying you, making sujood and so <laughs> yeah, on. It's yeah, just yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have uh, an issue of mine. When I pray, uh, he used to come and stand behind me and pray, imitating me, coming with my prayer. But I, I want to know when shall I teach him the proper way of prayer? Sure, but before that, I, you know, you just reminded me with a very interesting thing that the Prophet Sallallahu once was praying and uh, with Al Hassan Al Hussein came and he uh, climbed <laughs> over his back. So the Prophet Sallallahu took so long in the sujood that the companions, some of them, thought that the Prophet Sallallahu passed away <laughs> because it took him <laughs> so long. <laughs> so later on, they inquired, "What happened, Ya Rasulullah? What took you so long? It was such a long sujood." He said, "Well, my son was riding on my back, and I just hated to interrupt him." <laughs> <laughs> How beautiful! It's this, just this reminds me of, of things that happened in the states all the time. Like we would go to the masjid, me and my daughter. And uh, the brothers there would sometimes be very rough with her, you know, be like, what is this kid doing in this masjid? This is a masjid. And I'd always say, you know, well, you know, Hassan yeah. Hussein used to ride on the back. It happened to my, my country, my village. Uh, a guy came and yelled the people, threw them out of the mosque, don't come here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in fact, we have to keep balance. Yes, it's important and necessary to bring our children to the masjid as early as maybe two years old and make them get used to, to the environment, seeing people praying. But meanwhile, we have to make sure that they will not disturb the prayer, especially if there's a fard prayer or salat al jumuah and so forth, if there is a speech. So one thing which is very interesting I've seen in, you know, in the Western societies, they have like a babysitting place with a window that the children could see the parents so they feel safe, safe around. However, the parents and the rest of the uh, community are offering the prayer in peace. But when you bring your children and bring mine and they start making like, you know, a kindergarten there, <laughs> and then you don't, you don't reflect on anything on the prayer, you're totally disturbed, you know. Oh, you hear so you don't do it often. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're running back and forth. In the so you assign uh, a younger kid who can take care of them, sit in a babysitting room and so on, where, you know, prayer is essential for adults, okay. you know. Then we can come to your question, um, Brother Osama, which is as how early should we teach our pra uh, kids yeah. how to pray? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reported as saying that, عَلِّمُوا أَوْلَادَكُمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِسَبْحَ that Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, uh, recorded the Prophet ﷺ as saying that, 
teach your prayers the salah as early as the age of seven. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا لِعَشْرِ And discipline them to offer the salah regularly at the age of ten. Uh, I don't want you to understand that or uh, uh, get the concept that we should not really address our children with the salah before the age of seven. No. We're talking about teach them as how to pray properly now, mm -hmm. huh? regularly, perform the proper wudu and stand up uh, straight and bow down the proper way and so on at the age of seven. Then at the age of ten, they should be praying regularly like an adult. But, uh, but before that... Yeah. As I said that, I, I mean, it's a very beautiful feeling when I saw my son uh, a year and six months started coming next to me and copying me exactly, you know. Yeah, it is a beautiful thing to see. I have my three-year-old. She prays the complete prayer with me. So if it's like, you know, if we're praying for her, she stands, puts a little foot next to my foot, puts her hands up and prays the whole thing. And then my one -year -old this is does actually it the hadith of the Prophet sallam, that every child is born on the pure creed and the pure fitr. But it is his parents who would make him a Jew or a Christian or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Similarly, for a child who is born to Muslim parents, but they're not practicing the deen, what's going to happen? It's going to leave. Exactly. I've met people at the age of 45 have never observed fasting in their life. Wow. Then when uh, they came to Islam and Allah opened their hearts to guidance and so on, it was extremely difficult on them to fast. One of them said to me that I have never, ever in my life learned when did Ramadan begin, when did it end, at all. And now I'm asking him to start fasting for 30 days in a row, from dawn to sunset. You know, it's very, very difficult. And that's why uh, learning at a very young age is easier, much easier than learning while you're a teenager, than much easier than when you're an adult. Similarly with the prayer, this guy came to the masjid, as an accident that he had a, a, a son who died and so on. So they came for the funeral. And of course, he didn't know anything about the prayer. And he was so embarrassed. Most likely that embarrassment made him even reluctant further to come for any other prayer when he was an adult. But only one reason brought him, which is the death of his son. So of course, we take it from there. Imagine if you were raised since your childhood on practicing the salah on time, Joining your father while he's going to the masjid. No, today is Friday, and you're dressing up white, wearing your nice thawb, and going for the salah. It's a beautiful feeling. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. How, how, if he, before the age of seven, and he commits mistakes in prayer and, you know, uh, moving here and there, shall I correct him directly when he does these things? Or? You know, uh, this is very interesting because I see some parents. They like to get more and more from their children, but we need to uh, raise this banner where we keep it in our mind and in front of our eyes. Your son is not you. Your son is not you. Your daughter Still is not you. Cat. There's so <laughs> much differences between you both, okay? Yeah. And we have to take it gradually. So instead of picking on what was wrong and the mistakes, rather say, MashaAllah, that was so beautiful. Look at you. You are standing straight in the salah. You just pick on what was positive. You know, the good things, the good moves, yeah, which makes them love the salah. Exactly. That's, that's, that's how you coach someone. No, no. You're coaching football. That's what you yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You exactly. did a great job, but this little thing. I, I wouldn't even consider but for mm. now. I would just uh, yeah. mention what was positive and uh, put emphasis on uh, their way of performing the salah and so on. And I'm so impressed. Imagine the, the, the great effect on the child praising him for such an act. He will be waiting anxiously for the next prayer to show you much better than the, <laughs> the previous one. I always give my daughter a big hug and I go, oh, you did all for her. It's great. No. I'm so happy. And she's like, big, you know, smile yeah, like, yeah. you know, from, from here, here to here. here. You know, she's just so happy that, that you know, that, that child that is can happy. wait for the next prayer to show you a, a better job and can't wait to memorize Surah Al-Fatiha and, and, and. Yeah. Okay, will he receive the word for prayer or... Or me? Or well, a person is not necessarily required to offer uh, the ibadat, especially prayers, of course, uh, until the age of puberty. Yes. However, if a child perfects the tahara, the purity, performing ablution and so on, and perfects the salah, before that, his salah is valid and counts as a reward for him and, and for and the me. parents. The righteous parent. Parent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask something. 
so when shall I be harsh on the kid? Like, what? When shall I start? You know, like punishing him if he's not praying right or if he's not. You know, when is really recommended to keep the word harsh and punishment uh, in a storage room? Okay, light like okay. it up. Do not use it whenever you feel like you know you're frustrated with your child. Just remember that your child is not you; it's just a child. Okay, mm -hmm. try always to find any other alternative. And there are so many other alternatives besides a, a frown face, screaming, shouting, and sometimes hitting or beating, you know. Make this the last resolution ever. Always try to recommend other, you know, solutions. Uh, bring the concept of reward mm -hmm. instead of the concept of punishment. So when your child is seven years old and he starts praying with you, uh, it's not mandatory upon him to pray. You start instructing him. And by the time he reaches the age of 10, he will pray, he'll be praying as good as you exactly. So yeah, but sometimes he might you know, be sleeping. He doesn't want to wake up. You know, kids, sometimes on Friday, if I want to take him with me to the prayers, you know, like stuff like that. What would I do? I'm he's... glad you brought up the issue of sleeping while praying because this is not only limited to children. The Prophet <laughs> said even for adults, لِيُصَلِّ أَحَدُكُمْ نَشَاطَهُ فَإِذَا كَسُلَ فَلْيَرْقُدْ let one of you pray as much as you feel fresh and comfortable. But if you feel sleepy and lazy, this is for the voluntary prayer, then rest. Similarly, if the child cannot wake up and if the child did not get enough rest, that will take us to another area, which is uh, putting the right schedule for the child, as mm -hmm. what time should he go to bed, what time should he get up, and so on, so that he will get up early for Salatul Fajr. And if he takes as, uh, as little as six hours in a row of sleep, it will not be a problem to get up for Salatul Fajr so and start the day ever since. Wh what age shall I start waking him up to pray with me? Well, Fajr? this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He mm -hmm. said, at the age of seven. Seven. But children vary. You know, if you notice that there is a, a response, positive response from your child, that he willingly, he or she willingly came to join you in the salah. And you notice that there's an improvement every time, every time. So I think it's, he's inviting you to teach him. Exactly. You should not wait so and say, up. you know, You're no, not five. before the age of seven. <laughs> yeah. No, you go know. sleep, go sleep. You don't have to pray that. <laughs> You're only five. Come As a matter of fact, some parents <laughs> do that. Say, well, it's not for kids. It's not for kids. Wow. I remember that my parents used to say, you have to go and pray in the masjid. And we were very young. We would go to the masjid and there was this guy who was the keeper of the masjid who wouldn't like any kids in the masjid. And he would kick us out. Sometimes he would pick us up and just throw us outside the masjid. <laughs> this is crazy. You know, this is not <laughs> a, a, a very good thing to do because guess what? You just uh, a lot of non-Muslims. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he went straight with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So imagine that seeing uh, a child copying the father. That's a good sign. Also, a child may copy the father in bad things. That's why the kind father... Kind of like my manners here without yeah. offering you guys something to drink as always. So would, you like, <laughs> would you like some tea or yeah. some coffee or something like that, inshallah? Well, I would like some Nescafe. Some Nescafe, yeah. inshallah. Yeah. Okay. okay, Nescafe. 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 Uh, something yeah. cold. Something cold? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I have something cold. <laughs> Let me go check okay. in the fridge and see what I have this You got to find something, man. <laughs> you got to find something. In inshallah. I'll be back, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You must Welcome be back by yourself. <laughs> you came from the other side. Thank yes, it's so a nice much. place I have here. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll take you on a tour when the Sheikh leaves. Very <laughs> it's very spacious, very large. Yeah, yeah. I took this tour last week. Inshallah, <laughs> it's very nice. Uh, yeah, Sheikh. Uh, Inshallah. You know, <laughs> oh, Jazakallah, okay. I'll tell my wife. Um, uh, Ramadan is coming quickly, and I was planning on making my, uh, my daughter uh, start to fast half days. Um, she's three years old, 
Okay. And this might make me a Wahhabi extremist. But <laughs> she's three days old, and I'm thinking about making her start to fast half days to start to learn the, the joy of Ramadan, waking her up, have suhoor with us. And then when she wakes up around 10, let, actually let her, you know, wait two hours, and then she can eat, like, around noon. You know, you brought up a very important subject, which is uh, uh, to teach gradually. You know, as I mentioned about the person who is 45 years old and have never fasted, and now he's supposed to start fasting and so on. This is kind of difficult. But for my child who's three and four years old, you know, you can start by saying, you're going to fast for one meal. You're going to skip one meal. You're not going to have breakfast. But you're going to have breakfast, and you're going to have uh, lunch and so on. And you applaud the practice of the child, and you reward them for that. And you consider it a big deal. Oh, my son was fasting today. Asma was fasting today. You know, the whole family will celebrate that and will reward the child. So the child will be very interested in even prolonging the period of fasting. So you can start as early as the child can bear that. One hour, two hours, half day. And now we're going to organize it according to the prayer time. I'm fasting until Zahra prayer. Yeah. So the child is anxiously waiting for the <laughs> Adhan of Zahra. Why? Because that's, that's the time it. of breaking his fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, similarly, charity. I really recommend for the brothers and sisters in my community that, you know, if you're going to put a donation in uh, the donation box, uh, make a point that you put it before you're a child. But listen, before going to this point, uh, I, want, I want to ask, uh, uh, does the fast is like the, the same of a prayer yeah, to teach him to fast? till the age of seven and punish him by the age of ten? Or no, you see, for fasting, for fasting, the ulama sometimes, they apply fasting to salah and so on according to the hadith. But remember, whether it's fasting, it's a prayer, uh, it's only mandatory at the time of it's puberty. Puberty, not before that, yeah. okay? So he's not required by the law, the Islamic law, that to observe fasting on every single day of Ramadan uh, until he reaches the puberty age. But alhamdulillah, shukrullah, I have uh, in my community and uh, uh, some friends, their children, the age of six, seven, they fast for the entire month. MashaAllah. And they compete. You know, when there is a sense of competition, who's fasting today and so on, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's applauded and rewarded, you know. Yeah, exactly. What I was saying about the charity is, if anyway you're going to pay a donation to uh, the masjid or to any organization, have your children participate and play a role in paying the donation. Your child is, you know, three, four feet uh, tall. Mm -hmm. Pick up your child and give him the money. Have him the deposit the, the money box. in the donation yes. box. Yes. That will give him the sense of giving and being generous. This is how you teach your child generosity. Whenever you have a guest, ask your child that we have to bring the best of what we have for our guest. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most generous man, and so on. So, I mean, be yourself a role model. I remember my mom used to do that with me, because, you know, on Ramadan, or sometimes we pass by the, the you know, the, the, what you call it, you know, the cops, not the cops, the, the small cops, uh, the ones on the street, you know, the Asakir, you know, what, what, do they, what do you call the soldiers, them? Soldiers, uh, you know, not soldiers. Guards. Guards, the mm -hmm. ones that stand for the line for the uh, for the lights and stuff. They're yeah. very poor people and stuff. So my mom used to give me when I was very young the the, the boxes for food for them for for the fasting. Mm -hmm. So Inshallah. till now, Alhamdulillah, sometimes I'll do that. Like I because I got I learned it when I was really young, mm -hmm. and then I do it. You know, so would you tell us the impact of this practice when you were young mm -hmm. on your life now? How do you feel towards the poor people? It's amazing because the way I treat. Uh, I don't, I, like for me, I don't have poor or rich people. I treat everybody the same. And that's what I learned from my parents because they were very, uh, like our house was always open for anyone to come in and, you know, if anybody needs something. Every month, you know, I see a, a lot of people coming to take some, you know, sadaqah and mm -hmm. stuff. And my mom and my dad, they, they, they let me do it with them. You know, like uh, even the uh, mm. like my father intended Slattery. for me to, yeah, to attend it and, you know, since I was very young. And now I do it on my own, you know. It so feels... You know, you know Ismail, I think it's a good uh, opportunity also to seize this opportunity and address your child, your daughter, uh, as you let her fast for an hour or two, that at the time of eating, were you hungry? Yes, of course, because fasting is about hunger. 
-hmm. Well, guess what? There are a lot of people who are extremely hungry and there is no time for breaking their fast because actually there is no food for them. Mm -hmm. How about saving some money, and buying some food and sending this food to them? By that we accomplish the meaning of fasting. Yeah. I mean, you know, assisting and helping. What, what you were saying earlier about people doing bad also and how it affects the children. So if you withhold <laughs> your money yeah. and you teach your children to be stingy, if you smoke cigs, you teach your children to smoke cigs, yeah. do things like this. The same applies, right? You know, that's true. Many parents think that uh, my kids are good because they force them to be this way in front of them. And once they're absent and the kids are behind closed doors, they're on their own. And that's why uh, the parents have to be really intelligent and uh, refer to their children a bigger supervision. Not only the supervision of the parents, of somebody around them, no. The supervision of Allah, the Allah Almighty, Allah. the divine supervision. Yeah, I'll see you though. I remember visiting uh, uh, a friend's house. He had a son in high school. I have read on a paper, a copy paper, which was not uh, a frame or anything, and with handwriting. I have read the most beautiful statement which a man might write for his son or daughter. The statement read in Arabic, Lasta wahdak, Allahu ma'ak, yes. which translates as, you're not alone, Allah is with you. This statement shocked me. My skin was shivering when I read that statement, that your son or your daughter are always under the impression that uh, they're not alone. So whether they're being supervised by a human being or not, yeah. they're being seen and watched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That makes the person always, always in the favor look of doing something what, uh, which would please Allah subhanahu yeah, wa ta'ala. So you don't have to say, make sure that you don't turn the TV on. Make sure that you don't chat on the internet. And you leave and you know that he or she might do the opposite. This is very, very much uh, possible. Yeah, of course. And you can bring this to the mind of the children through stories. Like, you know, uh, the story of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi yes. salam and his the brother Harun. stories are, are amazing yeah. for kids. There is a particular point in this story when Allah appointed Musa and uh, Harun, peace be upon them, and he uh, commanded them to go to the Pharaoh. So Musa... Uh, talk on behalf of himself and his brother saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna nakhafu an yafurta alayna aw an yatra we're afraid that he might transgress against us he might even kill us so there you bring this story to the mind of your children and make them live it then all of a sudden you bring the beautiful answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salam and his, uh, and his brother Harun قال لا تخافا إنني معكما أسمع وأرى. Hey, don't you be afraid, يا موسى. Don't you fear? Why? Because I am with you. Who's saying so? It's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So the child is listening to the story and is very excited about what's next. He knows that the Pharaoh could do anything. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is keeping bad and saying, don't you worry, don't you be afraid the least. Since I am with you, I'm going to be with you. Asma wa ara. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen in this life. I cannot visualize him, but he can see me. I uh, cannot hear him talking because I'm not Prophet Moses, but he can hear me, even if I'm alone behind closed doors. So if you can bring this uh, concept to the mind, of your children, then you're safe and you are at peace. The one that really drove that whole concept home for me was uh, the story of uh, Abu Bakr and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in the cave. Exactly. You know, yeah. He said the third with us. Well, this who the third is always Allah. That's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. Even Abu Bakr as Siddiq was scared and he said that if any of them looks down, they would see us. Yeah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered him, Ya Abu Bakr, what do you think about two? Allah is their third. <laughs> You know, through stories, you can bring any concept exactly. yeah. Yeah. of good meaning to the mind of your children. It cannot be done by dictating to them and saying, hey, Allah is with you. You have to fear Allah. <laughs> uh, and instead of putting the concept of fear, 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 put first the concept of love. And then that will take us to another area, which is, why do we have to love Allah? I remember when I was a child once, my dad took me for a walk. And we passed under a bridge where trains were running, 
above the bridge. Then my dad asked me a question. He said, uh, how do you like this bridge? I said, it's so huge. It's magnificent. He said, who do you think that he architected and built the bridge? So I was talking about the builders, and then my father said, no, it was an architect who studied so much and graduated from an engineering school to be able to design this bridge. So I wonder how much time effort took that architect and engineer to design that thing, to acquire the proper knowledge, and this is just for a bridge. Mm -hmm. Then my father brought my, to my attention the bigger picture, Creator, yeah. <laughs> the bigger picture which mm -hmm. is the sky. Look up. Do you see any pillars? No. Mm -hmm. Do you see any hawks and ropes holding the sky? No. I wonder, how has it been done this way without pillars, without supports, without anything? Then the architect in this case is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it's very important to discuss certain ayat like the beautiful yeah. ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ وَالْفُلْكِ الَّتِي تَجْرِي فِي الْبَحْرِ وَالْفُلْكِ الَّتِي تَجْرِي فِي الْبَحْرِ بِمَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسَ وَمَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ مَاءٍ فَأَحْيَا بِهِ فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَّةٍ وَتَصْرِيفِ الرِّيَاحِ وَتَصْرِيفِ الرِّيَاحِ وَالسَّحَابِ الْمُسَخَّرِ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ So from the bridge to the sky, then to the bigger picture, which is not only limited to the uh, sky. No, as the ayah says, uh, verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and everything in between. In the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the alternation of night and day. You see the process of day and night very smoothly happening, you know. And in the sailing boats and ships in the sea. With that which is of benefit to mankind. And in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down from the heaven of the rainwater. That produces vegetations and fruits which is of use for us and for our cattle, uh, in the wind, in the clouds which are hanging between the heavens and the earth, those are all signs for people who reflect. So now you emphasize on the importance of reflecting, thinking, pondering. That can be done as early as four and five years old. Um, and of uh, course... I think it's time for us to go to the masjid. Uh, at the comma was a couple minutes ago. Well, then, inshallah, we'll continue next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me once yeah, again. Yeah, I miss you, your family. Yeah. Barakallahu yeah. feekum. Yeah. I have a question, but I think the time passed. Tell us. <laughs> thank you. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow is Sabbath. Come on the way to the masjid. Prayer, mask. man. Prayer. <laughs> 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 Can I hit the basket? No.